In the mid-1960s, actor Bob Crane quickly rose to fame when he was cast as the lead character, Colonel Robert Hogan, in the renowned sitcom Hogan's Heroes. His playful manner and comedic talents on screen endeared him to a wide audience and made him a household name almost overnight. After Hogan's Heroes ended, however, the actor's fame began to dwindle. Even after attempting to star in his own self-titled The Bob Crane Show, which only ran for 14 episodes, the actor soon learned that his 15 minutes of fame had run out. But then Bob eventually turned to self-producing. He was running a play called Beginner's Luck at the Windmill Theater in Scottsdale, Arizona, and was part of a dinner theater circuit. But then, on June 29, 1978, Bob would end up missing a lunch meeting with one of his co-stars in the play, Victoria Ann Barry. Victoria, who knew the apartment where Bob was staying, decided she would drive over to check and make sure everything was all right. When Victoria arrived at the apartment, however, she would unfortunately be met with a grisly discovery. In the bed lay Crane's lifeless and shirtless body. His once famous face was nearly unrecognizable due to the brutality of his injuries. He had an electrical cord wound tightly around his neck and the entire room was coated in blood from floor to ceiling. Victoria, shocked at what she had found, quickly phoned the police and a murder investigation was immediately underway. But still to this day, however, despite nearly 50 years passing, the publication of five books and three extensive investigations, the identity of Bob Crane's killer still remains a mystery. So please, join us today while we take a look at one of the most brutal and yet still unsolved celebrity murders of all time, the mysterious murder of Bob Crane. I'm your host, Andy, and this is Strange and Unexplained. Bob was born Robert Edward Crane in Waterbury, Connecticut on July 13, 1928. During his youth, he began to pursue an interest in music and started playing the drums and leading marching bands. Been there. With a strong desire to pursue a career in show business, he thought his musical abilities could be his way in. Crane would go on to become a member of the Connecticut Symphony Orchestra while he was still in school before finally graduating in 1946. After graduation, Bob would then go on to enlist in the Connecticut National Guard, where he would stay until being discharged in 1950. The previous year, however, Bob would marry his high school sweetheart, Anne Terzian, and the couple would end up having three children together, Robert, Deborah, and Karen. Following his time in the Connecticut National Guard, Crane transitioned into the world of local radio, where he quickly established himself as a rising broadcaster in the tri-state area. His sharp wit caught the attention of CBS, who brought him on as a host at their prestigious KNX station in 1956. During this time here, he had opportunity to interview iconic figures such as Bob Hope, Charlton Heston, and even Marilyn Monroe. Famous actor Carl Reiner was even so impressed with Crane's talent that he would extend an offer for him to appear as a guest on the Dick Van Dyke Show, which in turn led to another guest role on the Donna Reed Show, leading to a reoccurring guest role. Following this success, Crane's agents received a plethora of job offers, including one for a controversial script that Crane mistakenly believed to be a brash drama. The insensitive drama that Bob thought he had been sent turned out to be none other than the now legendary comedy series Hogan's Heroes. You know, the one with the funny Nazis? The premiere of Hogan's Heroes in the autumn of 1965 resulted in instant success. Although categorized as a sitcom featuring a laugh track, the show was able to distinguish itself with daring World War II-themed humor, showcasing Crane's lead character undermining Nazi officers with clever and humorous antics. You know, the way we did it in World War II. After his quick rise to fame, Bob began engaging in multiple affairs, despite still being married and having children. He apparently even kept a collection of supposedly consensual nude photos and videos of his partners and regularly displayed them to cast and crew members, even once going so far to earn his dressing room nickname, Porn Central. I don't think he's making it in today's industry. It was apparently due to his continued antics on and off set that executives decided it was time to stop sending Bob as many job offers. One of Bob's multiple lovers was his Hogan's Heroes co-star, Patricia Olson, 
whom he eventually married as his second wife in 1970. The couple went on to have two children together, but unfortunately, due to Crane's continued scandalous activities, it kind of led to the downfall of both his second marriage and his acting career. After Hogan's Heroes came to an end in 1971, the acting roles began to dry up. Having to seek new opportunities, Bob decided to move to Scottsdale, Arizona, where he would be starring in a self-produced play entitled Beginner's Luck. And it would be here in Scottsdale that we pick back up with the gruesome murder scene that fellow actor and co-star Victoria Ann Barry would discover that unfortunate afternoon in 1978. Victoria called 911 on June 29th, 1978, after finding a bloody and mangled body in Bob's apartment. On the same day, Bob's son Robert was scheduled to fly into town to visit with his father, but he hadn't yet arrived at the apartment. Due to the severity of his injuries, the police on the scene were actually unable to make a positive ID on their victim, leading them to have to contact the owner of the building, Ed Beck, who also happened to manage the Windmill Dinner Theater where Bob's play was being held. A quote from Beck, There was no way I could identify him from one side. The other side, however, yes. And in 1978, the Scottsdale Police Department, they lacked a dedicated homicide division which definitely hindered its ability to effectively manage such a high-profile murder investigation. And as a result, improper police procedure compromised this investigation from the very beginning. Even Victoria Berry, a key person in the investigation, was allowed unrestricted use of the phone while the medical examiner was conducting their initial investigation of Crane's body, which also included them shaving his head to gain a better view of his wounds. Furthermore, Crane's son Robert was granted access to the crime scene within the first floor apartment and allowed to come and go as he pleased while the investigation was still ongoing once the crime scene revealed little to no evidence, with no signs of forced entry and no valuable items reported missing. With that, the detectives then focused their attention on examining Crane's vast collection of home videotapes. You see, as it turns out, Bob Crane apparently well documented his personal sexcapades through both video recordings and still photographs. While working on Hogan's Heroes, Bob was introduced to John Henry Carpenter, who would go on to play a major and perhaps devious role in Bob's life over the next several years. John was a regional sales manager at Sony Electronics, who was well known for assisting prominent clients with their video equipment needs. The two developed a close bond and started socializing at various bars and nightclubs. Because of his fame, Crane garnered attention from numerous women, whom he would often introduce to Carpenter as his manager. And according to reports, Carpenter was said to be furious when the women who normally threw themselves at Bob no longer had any interest in the two men after Bob's TV opportunities began drying up. Bob's son Robert would go on to tell police that, he says, I am making changes. I'm divorcing Patty. He wanted to lose people like John Carpenter, who had become a pain in the butt, and he wanted a clean slate. He would continue to tell police about Carpenter and about reports he was told of the night his father was murdered. They had a breakup of sorts, and Carpenter lost it. He was being rejected. He was being spurned like a lover. There were eyewitnesses that night at a club in Scottsdale that said they had an argument, John and my dad. With the information that had been uncovered about their supposed suspect, the rental car that Carpenter had been using in Scottsdale was impounded and searched. During this, several blood smears in the car were found that matched Bob's blood type. There were no other individuals that had been reported in the car during the time of the rental. But unfortunately for everyone, this was still 1978, and due to DNA testing not being around at the time, and due to the fact that they could not locate an actual murder weapon, the district attorney chose not to pursue any charges against Carpenter at this time. With no other leads or suspects in the murder of Bob Crane, the case would sadly go cold. And Bob's funeral would be held on July 5th, 1978 at St. Paul the Apostles Catholic Church in Los Angeles. There would be an estimated 200 guests in attendance, including many big names of Hollywood at the time. The story of what happened to Bob Crane would slowly start to fade from the public eye after several years. But after over a decade of the case being cold, investigators were just about to get the break they had always hoped for. In 1990, Scottsdale Police Detective Barry Vassell and Maricopa County Attorney's Office investigator Jim Raines conducted a re-evaluation of the evidence from 1978. Now, despite inconclusive DNA testing on the blood in Carpenter's rental car, Raines discovered a previously unseen evidence photo that appeared to show the presence of brain matter in the car's interior. Now, although the actual tissue samples were long gone at this point, 
an Arizona judge still deemed the new evidence was admissible in court. It would then be after months of legal back and forth, but in June of 1992, Carpenter was finally arrested and charged with the murder of Bob Crane. Now, during the 1994 trial, Robert Crane testified that his father had frequently mentioned wanting to end the friendship with Carpenter in the weeks leading up to his death. He described Carpenter as a hanger-on who had become so bothersome that he was considered obnoxious. Robert recounted his father saying that he no longer wanted Carpenter around, and he revealed that Bob phoned Carpenter the night before his death to formally end their friendship. And during the trial, Carpenter's defense argued that Crane's numerous sexual conquests may have angered a multitude of individuals, including many angry boyfriends or husbands, any of whom may have been responsible for his death. They were also able to argue that since there was no murder weapon ever recovered, and that the police investigation had been nothing but sloppy since the beginning, that all of their evidence had been merely circumstantial. Witnesses were also presented who testified that the two men had dined as friends the evening before Crane's murder and did not engage in any kind of argument. Due to the continued lack of physical evidence or any sort of concrete DNA match being available at the time, John Carpenter was acquitted of the murder of Bob Crane in 1994 and would continue to maintain his innocence until his death, which would come only four years later in 1998. Ironic, maybe. After the acquittal of Carpenter, Robert Crane would go on to publicly accuse his father's widow, Patty Olson, saying she might have also had something to do with his father's untimely murder. In reference to Bob's will, which in fact omitted himself, his siblings, and his mother, and left the entire estate to Olson, Robert states that nobody got a dime out of his death except for one person. Now, these suspicions were reiterated in his 2015 book, Crane, Sex, Celebrity, and My Father's Unsolved Murder. The Maricopa County District Attorney Rick Romley responded to this. We never characterized Patty as a suspect, adding, I'm convinced John Carpenter murdered Bob Crane. Now, there would be multiple books written and even a film produced about the life and death of Bob Crane over the years after the 1994 trial. But in 2016, there would be one final Hail Mary put up for answers in the case. In November of that year, the Maricopa County Attorney's Office authorized Phoenix television reporter John Hook to request the 1978 blood samples from Carpenter's rental car be retested using a more advanced DNA technique than the one in 1990. The retesting revealed two sequences, one from an unidentified male, and the other one was too deteriorated at this point to draw a definitive conclusion. Unfortunately, however, these final tests that were done in 2016 destroyed the last remaining amounts of DNA evidence that had been kept from the crime scene back in 1978, thus making any more tests like this impossible unless some new form of evidence is ever uncovered. But now, even to this day, the arguments and theories over what happened to Bob Crane continue to persist. With Patty Olson dying of lung cancer in 2007, Bob's children still carry a torch for their father and continue to hold out hope that one day they may get some sort of closure to what actually happened that fateful night. But sadly, with each passing year, the chances of those answers revealing themselves get smaller and smaller. There you have it, folks. The tragic murder of Hogan's Heroes star, Bob Crane. A life and death that was filled with fame, fortune, sex, and ultimately murder. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you have, please don't forget to check out all our other shows here at TCG. And please check out our YouTube channel, where you can see videos like this one and many more. And of course, please like and subscribe for content just like this almost daily. And please join us next time. And until then, gang, remember, be strange, just don't be strangers. Bye.